everybody, this is Howard of Ford to Learn to Fly. Thank you for joining us on this video series of Learning a New Airplane. Today we're covering the legendary, the classic, the airliner that started everything, the Douglas DC-3. Let's go have a closer look, a detailed look, at this beautiful airplane. Let's get started on the legendary DC-3. I do want to mention the disclaimer here. I'm not a CFI, but I love teaching. been teaching my whole career for 30 years, but I love aviation also. I'm a pilot in real life, and I share my experiences. I learn the airplanes inside out, and then I help others to get introduced to it. It's really just an introduction to flying it properly instead of... Uh, guessing how things go. So we're going to get into a lot of detail here. It's a quite, it's, it's a long video. Uh, it's going to be a couple of hours typically, these videos, these lesson videos. And so pick the parts that you want, but or or you can go through it from start to finish and away we go. So let's take a look at this airplane. There's a number of liveries here. I'm going to use a couple of them in my demonstrations, but, uh, and you can add more if you wish, if you can add those to your systems. This is with Microsoft Flight Simulator, everybody. So let's talk about the background of this gorgeous plane. I'll get out of the way once in a while as needed so that you don't need to, so that you can read it. But if you take a look here, first flown in 1935 was the world's first successful commercial airliner, even though we had United Airlines with their Boeing 247, which we've covered in another session in Twitch previously. Um, so the DC-3, I think 18,000 were made. Low wing, twin engine, monoplane, various configurations, 24 or 28 passengers or carry 6,000 pounds of cargo. Military also adapted it, of course, for the war effort, and there's tons of them with different designations. Typically, the most well-known is the C-47. Uh, could have 28 fully armed paratroopers, 18 stretchers med with a medical crew, or military cargo, like two light trucks. Anything else that could fit through its cargo doors and not weigh much more than three tons. I mean, this was a real worker. So you can see the various uh, um, variations here, Skytrain, C-47, R-4D, or the Dakota. And there's even a version that carried only troops called the C-53. Pretty wild when you think about that. DC stands for Douglas Commercial, born from the request of transcontinental airlines back in the day. And uh, that's where it evolved from, from the DC-1, 2, and 3. So what did pilots think of it? Well, that's a really good question. I love it. And be, if you've ever been in one, this is history. If you get a chance to be in one, jump at it. Uh, hundreds are still flying today, and many of them are at air shows, and they'll take you up for flights. Here's a couple of pictures of some satisfied people. Never heard a bad word about it. But you can see in here, um, took off easily, cruised comfortably, ceiling of 23,000 feet. We're not going to test that today. Um, but the pilot said it landed itself, and it had a cruising range of 1,500 to 2,100 miles. So, you know, over 13,000 of them built. I actually saw a statistic that said over 18,000, but I'm putting in the conservative number here. That's a lot of airplanes. And so when you see them describing it here, land on short runways, remarkable reliability combined to keep it flying in all regions of the world. And there's plenty of them still around. And so, you know, this is uh, one of those classics. When I said I'm going to do something on this airplane in our Twitch sessions, I learned to fly night on Tuesdays. Everybody jumped at it and said, let's do it. So you can see in here, was it really a sleeper? There's a version called the Douglas Sleeper Transport. It's really a DC-3 converted into beds. And this is the way to travel, isn't it? I think the um, I think the price of a ticket back then was about $300, uh, which is the equivalent of about five or 6000 today. <laughs> Just to have one of these, I want to have a bed. You know, this is much like, you know, the, the trains. I remember taking trains from Rome up to, uh, I, I don't know where I went from there, but we did an overnight and it had sleeper beds like this, bunk beds, right in the train. It was so cool. So, you know, this would be quite the experience, especially when you're first on the ground, you're first sitting at quite an angle with the nose facing up to the sky. Maybe they weren't actually lying down yet. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. They were called stewardesses back then, and they had to be registered nurses also. Pretty wild. So I couldn't help but put that in there to give you guys an idea. Yes, there is the DST version. 
So you can see up here DC3, DST, C47, C53, R4D, Dakota, all the same plane, different configurations. And even after the war, a lot of those C47s were, you know, they made doors bigger or smaller or added a door. You know, they modified them quite a bit afterwards. So, so many variations out there. And here in the flight simulator, they give us a dozen or so, or you can get a dozen more off of flightsim.to or whatever. But height 17, two right cyclone nine cylinder air cooled radials without cowl flaps, or what I'm flying today, I'm flying the Pratt and Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp. We'll talk a bit about that engine so you understand what it is. 25,000 pound gross weight with a long range behind my head there. And as I mentioned about the cargo. So check your power bindings first and we'll talk about three different bindings you guys that I had to set up and refine as I learned to fly this plane because we need to have separate controls of each of these things when we do the run up. Now you could, you could map your mixture controls to one lever, you could. Typically we'll move both engines to the same. Same with your propellers if you don't want to do run up. But typically during run up, we do want separate controls so we can run up one engine first and run up the other engine second. And then in real life, you want to fine tune so the vibration, the difference in the frequency of those engines doesn't drive you bananas, all right, which it will for passengers. Back then, they didn't have noise canceling headsets. <laughs> so the stock Bravo profile is already mapped for all four levers correctly. I had to go in and make sure of that. Some of these mixture levers were mapped for something else too, so I had to get rid of those mappings. Um, so you might want to move them around. You notice the propeller levers are on the left throttle in the middle inside the plane in real life. Whereas our Bravos, our Bra those who have the Honeycomb Bravo, the throttles are on the left and the propellers in the middle. But it, it's still fine. Map them properly and away you go. Or you can move them around if you want. I also want to mention that you should set up your tail wheel lock. That has to be locked for takeoff and landing. Like many planes that do that back in the day. And so this is just a push into lock and pull out to unlock. Now this is hard to do in the sim. You got to have this view ready. I think it's like control seven or control eight or something like that. But um, I'm not going to keep showing that to you, but the, the idea behind it is map something to it. So what I did was I mapped this joystick button 29 on my Bravo, which is actually the go around red button on the throttle. So I can lock or unlock my tail wheel. Now this isn't as important when you take off. You could, you know, you're still ready. You're, you're positioned on the runway. You're ready to take off. You can lock the tail. You can go down here and look because the plane's not moving and lock it. All right. But it's more important when you're coming in for a landing as you land with that locked tail wheel and you're ready to taxi. Now you got to get your head under here and find it again and, and unlock it and get back out and make sure you're still on the runway. So as I'm in my rollout, I unlock it and then I've got steering when I'm slower, right? So that's something you might want to do. It's just a nice way, an easy way to lock or unlock it. Now they would reach down, the pilot would reach down with the right hand with same time that, you know, same idea as when they do the trims and they would simply find that lever and move it without even looking. So, you know, that's what they do in real life. Here we can't just reach down without looking. The last thing I had to do to make sure I could do run up properly and dem demonstrate run up properly is to disable the normal magneto settings on my alpha yoke. So these magneto settings right here do both engines by default. All right, there's no separate magnetos for one or the other. The left right means two separate spark plugs. It doesn't mean two separate engines. It doesn't mean left engine, right engine. It means two separate magnetos, two separate spark plugs on every cylinder. So you want to disable that and then just use them manually. When you use them manually in the plane, you're only doing it for run up and then you're leaving them on both on both. You're leaving your left engine on both, your right engine on both, and it stays that way until you shut down. So it's easy enough just to do it in the sim. We're going to go up to that view, control six, and we're going to manually do the run up with the magnetos, all right, the magneto levers. So clear those bindings. There's where they are, these five bindings. All right, and then that, that won't have an effect on your plane and you can do things properly. Let's go look at this engine, the Pratt & Whitney. This is what I love. I mean, Pratt & Whitney Canada made some amazing engines. Hundreds of thousands of airplanes use different variations of their engines over the years. The Beaver, and you go down the list of all the different uh, airplanes that use Pratt & Whitney engines. Now, this one's very interesting. It's a twin row. Now, it is called a twin wasp radial. Twin wasp. They're not talking about two engines. They're talking about this one engine. Each engine has a twin row of seven cylinders. 
the front row of seven. And if you look close, you can see that these ones here are, are still in the airflow, but they're set back. That's the second row. The second row of seven set back further, so the air still hits them. Two rows of seven gives you 14 cylinders. This is actually half of what you have on a Spruce Goose engine. Spruce Goose engine has four rows of seven cylinders. Ooh. So this, you know, Pratt & Whitney does it again. Actually, Pratt & Whitney, their largest piston-driven, non-turbocharged engine was the one that they used on the Spruce Goose. They never made a more powerful piston engine after that. They went turbocharged. So two spark plugs per cylinder, 28 plugs per engine, two overhead valves per cylinder, single speed centrifugal type supercharger. Now we're not using the supercharger. You typically use that at higher altitudes. You turn it on high blower and away you go. We're not doing that today, just so you understand what's going on. 1200 horsepower at pretty much, that's full RPM right there. 700 horsepower cruise. And uh, each engine dry weight, 1250 pounds. Pratt & Whitney does it again. We got two of these engines sitting in the airplane. All right, weight and balance in the simulator. Make sure you've set so that there's no red up here saying no, 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 no. And you see in here they've got some weight in here for uh, whoever's sitting in the seats. As you heard, it can take up to 28 passengers. That's a big payload. Um, this is your stock 50% tanks full. I couldn't do the whole, oh yeah, it's right there. It says 50%. I was going to say I couldn't do the whole weight and balance thing without scrolling. But here it shows us that we're good and it shows us we're in the CG limits. We're good. Weight and balance is fine. A lot easier here in the sim than it is in real life. We have to go calculate that. Now, as many of you know from my Tuesday evening lessons on Twitch, I do the seven steps to learning a new airplane. And this is the things you should do to get to know an airplane well. Don't be intimidated by all the switches, just like any airliner. This is the early days airliner. Um, they're all there for a reason. Just learn where they are and what are the most important. And that's what I'm going to show today. We're not going to go down the list and go, okay, from the left to right, here's what this switch does. Here's what that switch does. Yawn, boring, yawn, boring. You know, we're not doing all that. So we're going to go and do what's needed to get flying, the most important stuff. You can investigate and find more later. Read the manual inside out, do all of that, all right? So the first step in the seven steps is obtain the pilot's operating handbook of some sort. Back in these days, a lot of them called them the flying manual, the flying handbook, the airplane flying manual. You know, I mean, there's all different names. Eventually, we started calling it the pilot's operating handbook because it talked about every function of the plane and how we make it happen. That's the first thing, because everything's in there, the way the manufacturer intended it to be done. Second, learn the vital speeds. And we're only going to go through the most important ones, takeoff speed, landing speed, cruise speed, some of the, in this case, some of the uh, manifold pressure settings and RPM settings in different configurations. Third, learn how to handle multiple engines. We've got two engines here. How do we handle them? Well, we got two levers for each, uh, you know, we got a lever for each engine for each function. And that, uh, you know, that uses up all six levers, but you certainly could map them. Uh, number four, get or make a checklist. There's, there's one right in the manual. There's also, I think it's still here in this presentation, there's a link to my Twitch chat. It's the Ford or Learn to Fly Twitch chat. And in there you can type in exclamation point POH or exclamation point checklist or exclamation point checklist mod. I'm using the enhancement mod from flightsim.to. This one right here. So there's the Duckworks DC3 improvement mod. And I've only done that because the flight model, what a gorgeous picture. The flight model has been in increased, reworked the flight model, replaced windshield wipers, detailed map, carb heat indications, custom engine startup logic. I mean, lots of this stuff that they've done, the views, I love the new views. So this is what I'm using, you guys. And so if you're going to use it also, then uh, by all means, you know, uh, if you can do this, if you're on a PC, then by all means, make sure that you give the credit where the credit's due subscribe to them and also buy them a coffee you know like the whole idea and uh the more these guys make such great things the more that uh they'll do more yeah. all right so um get make a checklist there is a checklist you can find this is a, a legendary plane there's checklists everywhere and um but i'm going to use the checklist that comes with the manual that comes with this plane now i found i only found this yesterday so i didn't use it the whole time when i made this presentation i was using all my other materials but this manual that comes with this plane is in the official folder, not in the community folder. This is a plane that comes with the 40th anniversary, and so it's in the official folder. So if you can find your community folder, most of you can now. Back up one, you'll see two folders or more. You'll see an official folder. 
go into that folder and you'll find the DC3 folder and in there you'll find the documentation. Number five, learn about the blue knob propeller lever. Um, a lot of people don't know about it. They're flying planes with FADEX single throttles. They say, what's with this blue knob? What do I do with that? And we did a whole Tuesday night lesson on that. I understood what it does and how, you know, mixture works with it and how throttle works with it. But here we're going to just do the basics. We're just going to, what is the setting for that? All right. They call it the propeller lever. It's got a P on each lever. And uh, we'll just understand what it does. All right. As we go along. Cockpit orientation now. In number six, we just go through the different views and we take a look around where is everything and what is the most important stuff. I'm not going to go down the list of all the switches. You can read those labels eventually. But how do we get this thing started? There's a few switches on the left, a few on the right. Once we're started, what other switches do we need? Um, so we want to understand that. Finally, step number seven in any procedure here that I've done with learning a new airplane, take it for a spin. Get to the practice area at altitude and get comfortable with it. I'm going to just take it out toward the practice area. I'm going to head north. I'm going to go east. I'm going to come back. I'm going to put this back down on the on the runway. I am at uh, Oshawa Airport, Charlie Yankee, Oscar, Oscar. And there's one of the buildings right there that you can see. The flight school is right around here to my left. And there actually is a DC-3 at Oshawa Airport here in Ontario, Canada. And um, right now it's painted sort of a red, white, and blue, even though we're in Canada. <laughs> but it's a gorgeous looking thing. And I've actually been taxiing out in my 172 in real life and saw this thing up ahead getting his clearance to take off. And, you know, I stopped my taxi. I stopped my 172 right there on the taxiway. And I got out my camera and I took some pictures. Here, look at this. I mean, is that a gorgeous thing or what? And so I watched him go out and get ready to take off. And then I watched, you know, I heard on the radio that they cleared him. And then away he went. And it was like, wow. And it lives here at Oshawa Airport. So I just, that's where I'm going to fly out today in the sim. All right. So very first step, let's go through the steps, everybody. Here we go. This is the DC-3 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. You can use the same checklist or a different checklist. You can use it in X-Plane. You can use it in FSX. It's the Century of Flight Edition brought out the, the DC-3. This plane's been around in our simulators for a while. But this is the manual that comes with it. And uh, and here I'm showing you exactly where to go. Back up until you can get to wherever your community folder was and go into the official folder. And you'll see that right there. We're going to use this manual as we go along for all the different phases. Cockpit orientation, mapping controls, takeoff and landing, cruise settings, engine management. It is all there. But we're going to keep it as light as possible, even if it is a long YouTube video in this case. And uh, we're still going to try and keep that as light as possible. So here we are in the cockpit. This is actually with the, what's called the retrofit livery. There's a few of those. And it gives you the GNS 530, 430, which many of us are familiar with. It gives you full autopilot with a cap 140 right here, which a lot of us are familiar with, with the WB Sim airplane and a bunch of other planes that use that. So if you prefer that and you prefer autopilot, fine. I'm going to be using the gyro pilot, the original instrument that should be in here. And it's not an autopilot set and forget, but it is a pitch and heading hold. So we're going to go look at that. Uh, anyway, uh, yoke in the left and all your levers and switches in the right hand is the best way to go. Step number two, you can see I'm going to try to move along because it's long and lengthy. And we got some demonstrations all along the way and uh, from start up, cold and start to shut down, cold and start. I mean, cold and dark. And so learn the vital speeds in here. I've highlighted the most important ones. Stall speed's good to know. Never get down that low. It's in miles per hour because the airspeed indicator's in miles per hour. So this is what I do in these lessons. Whatever that airspeed indicator says, that's what I want to quote here. For those who want reference to that, I've put in what the, the, the knots equivalent is just by using a Google converter. But, you know, the point is that if this is what the indicator says, that's the numbers we want to burn into our brain. And that's important, you guys. Now, cruise can be many different speeds. So this is the typical cruise. I do find myself cruising higher than this. But this is probably like an economy cruise here. Now, if you don't understand what inches of mercury is, or if you don't understand about MP versus uh, RPM, we'll just show you some of those settings as we go along. Never exceed 207 miles per hour. It, you know, it actually can, it can cruise at 207, so it just depends on this particular airspeed, and this is why it's controversial. I brought these numbers in from a different checklist and a different manual for the DC-3, 
and then the one we're flying, you can see the never exceed is up here at 255. 255 never exceed. I like this better. So the sim one, I like better. I want to point that out because this came straight from a flying manual, an original flying manual for the DC-3. And, um, and I, I think it's the Kindle edition that I bought. And so in there, it did say 207. Then I found this manual. And in this plane, maybe because it's supercharged, we've got ourselves a 255 never exceed. All right. Um, best glide 132, but really our normal climb, best rate is our normal climb, 121 um, miles per hour. I'm actually climbing somewhere around 90, somewhere around 90, and I'm really climbing. So obviously I'm doing best angle. When I find myself climbing at 90, I'm doing best angle, which is typically a statistic they give you for a takeoff over a five, uh, over a 50 foot obstacle at the end of the runway, like trees. So you use best angle. All right, so that's the idea. That's just some of the ones we need to know. Rotate 97, good to know. Rotate 97. Once you're up to that speed, time to rotate, which means offer your wings to the wind. Well, when we take off with this plane, it's a tail dragger, everybody. We start out like this, facing the sky. As we gain speed, it will level up like any tail dragger to the slipstream. And as we gain more and more speed, we'll get some lift. As it reaches 97 miles per hour, we pull back gently on the stick and up it goes. All right, so it's it's very different than a normal tricycle kind of gear kind of airplane, which is the majority of them today. Um, so we've got a, if you've mastered tailwheel techniques, then you'll understand how this works. All right, and we'll do a demonstration of takeoff, we'll do a demonstration of landings, and we'll see how that works. Cruise speeds and indicated miles per hour, as you see on the airspeed indicator, we can see maximum level flight what, depending on the weight of the machine, all right? You can see in here, maximum glide 255. What? You know, way up here. I don't want to get down fast. <laughs> I'll do something later. <laughs> maximum for extending landing gear. So you can drop your landing gear on approach before you can drop your flaps. Typical, you know, landing gear won't get hurt as much as flaps will if you're over speed. But your flaps, let's 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 take care of those and make sure we're low enough to extend flaps. Too many of you in the sim will drop flaps just to lose speed. You could be up at 200 and you'll just drop flaps and hey, it works. And it doesn't seem to damage them in the sim. In real life, you take care of those flaps because someone else is going to need them after you. And you want your plane to always be safe, mechanically safe and, and all of that. So we honor this. We respect this. And we will not. The manufacturer says over 112 miles per hour, you're probably going to wreck the flaps. You'll warp them. You'll break them. The linkage could get loose. Something could go wrong, you guys. So practice that in the sim. If you don't know how to slow down without flaps, then you need some basic lessons, all right? And what I mean by that is a simple way to slow down as you're turning to approach or you're turning to base. A simple way to slow down. Pull back on the stick and hold your altitude while you pull back on power. So think about this. Pull back on stick or yoke. Pull back on power. Hold your altitude, all right? You'll bleed off speed fast until you hit the right numbers and now set your attitude for wherever you're going, probably in for landing. All right, so that's a very easy, quick way to get slow enough. Now I apply flaps. Now I trim for flaps. And every time you hit more flaps, you'll probably see the nose turn a bit more. Trim for that. Hit more flaps, you'll see the nose trim for more. So, you know, that's something that a lot of people keep asking me about. I keep saying, well, I could do a whole lesson on how to slow down, but it would be over in 10 minutes. But, you know, so I've done whole lessons on a Tuesday evening on landings, setting up properly for a stable and approach and all that. But anyway, just keep that in mind. You guys try to do it realistically. All right, multiple engines. We've got these gauges to look at and then, per, you know, performance gauges after that to talk about the pressures, fuel pressure, oil pressure, hydraulic pressures, temperatures of your oil, temperatures of your um, coolant, I mean, or sorry, not coolant, temperature of your engine. There's no coolant here, you guys. And so, you know, these things are all important. We'll go look at all those gauges and see how to manage it. But it's really managing your levers, looking at your gauges while you're doing it, and managing those two engines, and away we go. So I'll show you these first, and then we'll get to cockpit orientation afterwards, right? But here are the center console right by the levers. Here's your supercharger levers on the left. We're going to leave those back in the low position. Here's our carb heat levers right here. We're going to leave those in the cold position until we're up to into cruise. Um, and then here you can see the MP gauge selector, and it's got different uh, selectors here. We're just going to leave it like that. And we're going to use these two as our main indicators. There's two 
needles on each of these dials. Each needle it says left or right on it. So you've got both engines right here in front of us for manifold pressure, both engines right here for RPM. And that's what we need to fly, as any of you have known when you've done this with any plane that has MP. Fuel tank level selector, select which tank you want to look at. Rather than clutter us with a ton of gauges, let's use one gauge and a selector switch. This one's important, the engine oil temperatures. We're looking at both engines, we want them to be in the green. That's a normal glance on cruise check, it's a normal glance on downwind, it's a normal glance in our checklist as we go along. You know, when we do a typical downwind checklist, it's primer, master, mags on both, switches are all in, circuit breakers are set. Uh, sorry, circuit breakers are all in, switches are all set, uh, landing light on if you need that. Now we're looking across, so we're just going left to right, we're looking across at engine oil temperatures are in the green, fuel is on and the quantities are good, we're ready to go. You know, and these are all the things you look at in your checklist as you're going across the engine. In almost every plane you got some type of checklist on your downwind, checklist on your final approach or your long final. In this plane we also have to make sure we have landing gear in our checklist, right? If you're used to fixed planes like I am on a 172, my checklist says landing gear. Yep, welded and locked. Yep. But you know, you still got to have that checklist because you're going to forget landing gear. All right, other engine things. Um, this is the co pilot side, the right side. You can see there's our main instruments in the middle. So over here, cylinder head temperature. That's got to stay within the green. So the general rule of all these gauges, which is gorgeous, is they're color coded. Stay in the green, you're good. Stay in the green, you're good. Now, carburetor air, we can change that with these blue levers you see down here by my side. Those blue levers are in the cold position. L means lock, and then a carburetor heat for the left and a carburetor heat for the right. And once you set those, then you use the lock lever so the vibrations don't set them back somewhere else. All right? That's what all that's for. And you can check the carburetor air and keep it in the green. Again, it's, it's healthy for the carburetor. Also, carburetor heat will get rid of any buildup of ice in the throat of the carburetor, and uh, this is something we want to stay in the green. Hydraulic and de-ice pressures, these are important. Outside air temperature, that's important. These are all important things for engine handling, as you, as you see here. All right, engine run-up is next, everybody. So what do we need to do once we've got this thing started and rolling? We're going to be doing an engine run-up. And the whole idea behind it, um, advanced throttles until RPM reaches 1500. Well, 1500 is a good number to leave it while you're sitting there idling, talking, looking around, waiting for it to warm up. 1500 is good. Generators are working fine. Everything's great at this RPM. Right down to complete idle, you'll see hydraulic pressures drop. You'll see uh, oil temperatures drop. You'll see lots of um, things. Pressures typically will drop. I'm sorry, oil, oil temperature might stay up there, but you know, so, so in here now we're going to go and do what's called the run-up. For those who don't know, you do this on every airplane before every flight. You're stress testing the engines before you leave the ground. Because if something's wrong, you can stop it and get out. All right. Um, if you have to do some type of check like this while you're in the air, what if there's something wrong? All right. So you're testing it while you're on the ground. All right. And you're taking the uh, manifold pressure up to 30, so 30 on the dial. We don't have that in front of us, it's behind the picture, but we'll show that. I'm gonna actually do a demonstration of the run-up, 30 inches of mercury on, on the uh, manifold pressure. And then we're gonna move the magnetos back and forth. In other words, we're testing one engine, we're testing both spark plugs, both magnetos, that'll go left and right, plugs to each cylinder. That's what we're doing. We're also gonna do a quick check on the hydraulic pumps to make sure they're working. Flaps is a great way to test it. Same with the flaps are electric. It's a great way to test your electrical system because you can use the flap lever, which will then put some stress on the hydraulic system to make sure it actually works. Here in this sim, I'm actually using the flap lever. I don't see that hydraulic pressure waver one bit. It's rock solid, we're good. But in real life, that probably would go down just a little bit because you're using some of that pressure, right? And then certainly go around through all the instruments. So we'll go through that. Now here's the checklist I was using originally. It had all kinds of numbers in it and I had that in this presentation. And then I finally found the manual that came with this sim, uh, with this version in this sim. And so those numbers were different for some reason. You can do this if you go to my Twitch channel, Ford or Learn to Fly, then you will be able to type an exclamation point checklist. They're all still live in chat, even if we're not broadcasting right now. And here's the modified checklist that comes on here in the improvement mod. 
All right, checklists are important. We keep them with us. I'm saying print them, laminate them, because what if your tablet doesn't work? What if whatever you're using for checklist isn't working? Um, a lot of us will have paper-based, even in real life, paper-based checklists that we use because um, they're dependable. The blue knob, propeller lever. All right, propeller lever also controls RPM because there's a governor in the front of the plane in where the engines are. And we'll show you that. We'll show you what that looks like. This lever will change the pitch of the blade, just like that, of all the blades of that engine. All right, that's what that lever does. As it bites more air, it needs more torque, so RPM could increase. And as it bites less air, RPM could decrease. So it seems that this lever controls RPM, and that's the gauge you would look at. Manifold pressure is your throttle, your manifold pressure. And manifold pressure is really suction at the intake manifold of each of the cylinders. It's really what it is. It's not pressure, really. It's suction. But we're just looking at the other end. It's going to be the same number either way. Manifold pressure, we're going to set that using our throttles, and the RPM will set that using the RPM lever. Typically, cruise is where we mess around with these things. On takeoff and landing, it's full forward, typically. It'll make it easier for you guys as we go along through this. Other conditions, descent. Take your RPM down low, we all know that. And your MP, you typically leave MP full for all these conditions because you want to be able to do a go around if you have to. Um, here you are downwind at 1750 full. Approach, up, achieve your flap speed. Flap speed is 92 knots, I think, here uh, on final. And then land, obviously take it to idle as your wheels touch the runway. Yeah, I typically take it to idle as I cross the threshold because I want to bleed off speed from that point, all right? This is one big heavy airplane. That's for sure. Cockpit orientation, just giving you the you know the bigger view first, and then we'll dive into each of the areas after that. The left side is the pilot six pack plus all the navigation instruments down below. The co-pilot side has a lot of the engine instruments plus a few of the six pack over here. Navigation, whatever you're using, this is the retrofit, or you can use classic, which I'm going to be showing you. I couldn't help but tell you that these are the windshield wipers right here. <laughs> <laughs> on the plane. Uh, Joe, I, I laugh because it actually works well on the sim. It does work, right? Levers are here, of course. Flaps indicator over here on the left. You see that? That's important right over my head there. That's important. We want to monitor that as we're coming in for approach. Over here on the right, I didn't label it, but there, whoops. Over here on the right, I didn't label it, but there are some switches right here. This is your passenger door. I'll get a closer view later. Passenger door, cargo door, and security switch. Security switch puts chocks under the wheels and it puts fire extinguishers on the ground. I mean, so that's pretty cool. Now, you can use like all the uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, products that we're flying. We can use the control key, hold it down and press a number key for all these different views and get used to them. We're going to be using control six a lot because that's looking up at all of our switches for run up and switches for lights and switches for um, getting the engine started and all that. One of our most common views that we'll use. Cockpit orientation. Let's go there now to the switches. As you can see, I'm only highlighting the ones we really need with circles. Ground power, we'll put that on first. We'll leave the battery off. But there are these over here if you really want them. Those of you who don't want to go through the authentic startup process, you can just go over here and do a quick start. Or here, cold dark switch. What does that do? So you guys can play with this. It describes it in the manual. I like doing things more realistic. I like to learn about these legendary airplanes. And it says ground power first, which puts a cable underneath the belly of the plane and shows a little generator on the ground like this. And so um, once you have that connected, uh, turning that on will put that on the ground for you and you leave your battery off. Now, you could put pitot heat on in a typical walk around before we get in here and start turning things on. In a typical walk around, we turn on the battery, we turn on pitot heat, leave it on for a while, a few seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, turn them both off again. We go out and we actually put our hand around or even feel the heat if there's any type of warmth coming off that pitot tube. And that's a check that we do in walk around. We're not doing walk around here. But I just wanted to show you where that was. These are the ones we're going to be using for sure, the engine primers. So the, mainly the two power switches and the engine primers on this screen, certainly landing light when we're coming into land, etc. Just showing you the essential stuff. The rest you can figure out, you guys. 
Here in the center now, I'm going left to right. I just finished looking at left. I'm going over toward the right. And you can see there's a decision height meter, altitude limit switch. What is that all about? We're not doing that today. But here's the compass. And down below, we also have um, some navigation instruments that'll help us. Here are the magnetos. This is very important for our startup right there. We're going to be using these over here too. So let's go look at that now. Oh, yeah, let's go look at the top first. We're going left to right. Right above us is the typical classic radio stack. Look at this thing. I see this in a lot of 172s exactly like this. Audio panel at the top, COM nav radios, COM 1 and 2 nav radios in the middle, ADF underneath that, automatic direction finder, and transponder set for North American 1200. Way, way, way we go. All right, now we look at the right side. This is where we're going to be doing our startup sequence in conjunction with the primer switches on the other side. All right, once an engine is running using these switches and the proper procedure, we'll see, we'll do the right engine first, we'll see that there is current happening, we'll see that there is a voltage happening. After that right engine start, you can actually turn off the external power. All right, and you know, if you don't turn it off here in the sim, you could turn off the external power later, but really nobody wants to get in between two spinning propellers and try and unhook that thing. So they would come in from the non-engine, the non-working engine side and pull that plug. And then we just turn it off. All right, on the far right now, cockpit orientation on the far right side, this is where we're going to see our landing gear pressure gauge. That's going to be for the landing gear, or else we have to do it manually pump. And over here, we can see hydraulic system pressure gauge, and we're going to look at that and make sure that's always there. Right here is our cowl flaps. These are the flaps that are around the engine on the outside, and we'll show you that in a second here. Actually, there it is. And uh, we, are, we want to look at those cowl flaps um, in different phases of flight. But here's the general rule. These flaps open and close to keep the airflow, the heated air inside, or to let the heated air vent out. That's the idea behind them. And so cowl flaps, and they're only on here on the uh, Pratt & uh, Pratt Whitney Wasp um, twins that we have here, because uh, the cyclone, the right cyclones for this plane don't have cowl flaps. But anyway, the point is that you would have these in the closed position to keep the engines warm or when you're finished like it is now. You don't want birds and insects in there. So you leave it closed when you're cold and dark. You'd leave them completely open when you are on the ground because you are at lower RPM and you are going slowly on the ground compared to flying. So engines can get overheated very easily. We're leaving the cowl flaps open on the ground. And then we would leave them on a setting called trail which is an auto setting. It'll adjust the cow flaps according to speed. All right, that's actually good. So we got to remember to do that after we take off and get to cruise. All right, we're going to set that and we leave it until we're ready for landing and we'll probably open them back up for landing. Navigation, here's the A3 gyro pilot, which I'll demonstrate. Um, I'll do both demonstrations of the uh, retrofit 530-430 and the cap 140. Um, and then I'll also do this. This is the one that I love doing because this is the classic. They didn't have a 530-430 back in the day. And uh, these are really, the gyro pilot is not an autopilot, really. It's a heading hold, pitch hold. That's all it is, right? Which is like your basic function when you turn on autopilot. You don't give autopilot, in conventional planes, you don't give autopilot any parameters. It'll do whatever your pitch is right now, pitch hold that. And whatever heading you got, let's level the wings. It won't actually, I don't know if it does an actual heading hold, in a conventional plane, it does a wings level, and wind can make you drift, of course. But anyway, this is uh, this is an actual heading hold, hold that heading, and uh, and pitch hold, and we can play with these instruments. And I'll show you how to make it happen. And here it is, where it's locked in, and it's actually holding at the position. Both of these scales are showing the same number, and it has caught up with each other. Now, that just like in an autopilot, you can adjust your heading here, with uh, sorry, with this guy here, you can adjust the heading and your plane will go there. It's actually pretty cool how that works. Even back in those days, turn your heading to a new heading and you'll see these two scales start moving and the plane's actually banking. It's like pretty cool. Now this is a pitch hold. You can see this is at the at rest position. Think of the orange bar as the nose of the plane. Think of the yellow one as a straight and level. So you bring that orange bar back to straight and level you should be at straight and level. Take a look at your feet per minute. Take a look at your vertical speed indicator. All right, and you'll see that it should be in the middle. If it's down here, you're probably coming in for a landing. You know, like it's pretty cool how this works. 
And again, you can adjust that while the system's running and, uh, and adjust the pitch of the plane as we go along. So it isn't, you don't set an altitude. It's a pitch hold. Interesting, isn't it? And a heading hold. Here's what's called, well, I call it modern here in, the, in this presentation, but Andrew, my co-host on Twitch, reminded me it's called retro, uh, actually, I'm just th starting to think of the word now. Is it retro install retro? <laughs> what is it called again? <laughs> uh, retrofit. There we go. And so here we see the, the familiar 53430 for a lot of us who fly planes well, from 172 all the way up. Many of the GA planes have these in there. And here's the Cap 140, which is a very... It doesn't say it on it, but I can see that it's a Cap 140. It's got all those same functions. And uh, we're used to that from when we use the uh, WB Sim 172, right? The realistic 172. All right. Navigation. There's some instruments for that. Radio compass, ADF pointer. We can see radio altitude. We can see an, uh, an, a VOR here. So uh, an OBS indicator with a CDI. So, you know, this is all stuff that we can use. Perfect. Tailwheel lock, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the tank selectors, it's not on my checklist in this manual, but we got to go and turn those tanks to some type of on position on both engines. There's one on each side, and I'll show you where that is. It's on top of the pedestal up above there, like that. And so it's in the off position right now. Think of this as a wing at the back to help with leverage. You can use the rest of your fingers to help turn it. It's a valve. It's a fuel valve inside this case, and it's in the off position. You want to put it left over here. Just click over in this area. Click left over here for left tank, right for right tank for normal operations. Use your auxiliaries if you need to. Set those before you do priming. Set those before you do anything to start the engine. Here in the middle, look at this. This is great. Engine pump. Hydraulic shutoff. Everything here works. Emergency shutoff here works. Flap handle. I don't know if the flap... Yeah, I did. I pulled it out and made it work, but I'm using my flap handle in my home cockpit. The flaps lever, you know, to make all this happen. Same with landing gear. I've got a landing gear lever here in the cockpit. Now, the landing gear does have an actual lock on the floor. You put the landing gear in one position or the other and lock the lock handle with a collar. It actually works here in the sim. Beautiful. All easily accessible. Here on the floor, oh, actually, there's the locking pin for the, the landing gear. It's the gear latch. It, it locks it down or locks it up so you don't accidentally, you know. And this little collar here, you click it and it flattens down onto the floor and then you can unlock cool but the point of this one here is to show you there is this fire extinguisher and fuel and oil cutoffs inside the floor compartment click it and it opens up like this and you can see what needs to be done here all right last but not least is take it for a spin now this is kind of quick you guys because this is standard procedure for every airplane that we learn on the channel and so now we take it for a spin. I'm saying for all of you, if you haven't flown this plane before, start it on a runway, spawn in on a runway. I don't always encourage that, you guys. I try to encourage normal flying procedures, cold and dark on a ramp, taxi with taxi clearance, takeoff with takeoff clearance. Those are all things you should do. So I'm saying do that as a final. As you get used to the plane and you just spawn on a runway and go, now spawn on a parking spot, cold and dark, and learn startup procedures properly and shut down procedures when you're done. Not everybody has that kind of time to start with. Get it up. I've only got half an hour at lunch. I'm going to spawn on a runway and go because I just want to fly. So that's the beauty of the sim for sure, you guys. All right. These are two main variations, a float version, which I haven't even tried yet. And uh, I have never seen one in real life. There's, there's got to be some, of course. Um, I love float planes, as a lot of you know, but, um, you know, the Beaver's my favorite. My 172 with floats is my second favorite. And then there's the Goose, and they go down the list of all the... And then Spruce Goose, and there's all kinds of planes with floats that I love because I love nautical and I love flying. But you can take the standard DC-3. I suggest you get familiar with using the tail dragger. Work with that because that's the main configuration for their airlines over all the years. Um, all right, so... Um, your livery decision will include the modern navigation or the gyro pilot, or what's now called uh, retro. Retrofit, retro, yeah, 
retro. <laughs> I'll just call it modern. <laughs> and you can see all these different ones now. You can see in there classic or something else on it. And it probably says retro underneath. I should have put it on the screen so you can see what it says. But the whole idea behind it is they've got a, quite a few liveries and even more that you can add. Andrew was flying the C-47 livery, the Army uh, designated livery, when he was flying on stream with me. How much does one of these cost? I'm still skeptical about this, the statistic that I read. Maybe that statistic was made 20 years ago because a brand new Cessna Skyhawk is going to be a quarter of a million dollars today. I'm serious, you guys. Maybe a used Skyhawk for 150 yep. But here, look at this, 600 to 700 per hour. Ooh, you better have some passengers or some cargo that are paying for that. All right, let's go to demonstrations, you guys. That's a lot of talking. It's a lot to take in. We've got checklists. We've got speeds. We got. We know where we're at. We're going to use the checklist in front of us, and we're going to follow the checklist as they go along. And the whole idea behind all of this is that we want to go and take a look at that checklist or take a look at the manual just to see what it looks like. So what I'm going to do is just open up the manual right here. Over here in the manual. Now let me just go through the manual just briefly, you guys. I just want to give you an idea about the manual. At the very bottom of the manual, it talks about cold and dark and quick start switches. The auto start, auto shutdown, if you want to do things fast. At the end of the manual. Further up is our normal checklists, which is what you should end up using. But before that, they give you your checklists with pictures, which is awesome. After landing, cow flaps, now I have a visual what they're talking about. Flaps up, I have a visual what they're talking about. Booster pumps off, I have a visual. And this is beautiful the way they've done this, in, you know, with the actual checklists. Man, I got planes going over top. Uh, so, um, and then other information all the way through. But, you know, here I am starting at the bottom going down. So there's the cover, and there's this, the get to know your DC3. And I love how they've put together. You could just use the manual. You don't even need this presentation because look how gorgeous this is. Beautiful pictures, gorgeous uh, numbering, identification, a lot more detail than I'm giving you. I'm giving you the basics to get started and the essentials. And look at all the stuff that they're adding in here. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So keep in mind, this is a great thing to have. Go down to your checklist section and during our demonstrations, we're going to be down here in our checklist area. And we'll start you know, down here where it says start your engines. All right, so let's get to the start your engines before takeoff. Starting, we're going to start from here, everybody. I'm starting from cold and dark, and then we'll take off from there. All right. Here we are with the DC-3 at Oshawa Airport. Charlie Yankee, Oscar, Oscar, C-Y-O-O. And uh, this is the home of uh, DC-3 that is painted beautifully but it was originally when I saw it back in the 90s it was looking like this no paint at all beautiful shiny body and it's been there all these years let's go and start this thing up uh, the first thing we want to do is to get some power into it with the external up here with the external ground power the switch way up here at the top turn that turn that on and that's all we're going to need for external power Let's have a look outside, and you can see the external power is hooked up. The generator right here at the base beside me there, hooked up to the belly of the airplane. Look at how high the pilots sit off the ground because of the this tailwheel air, airplane. This is a classic. This is legendary. This has been in many versions of simulators, and uh, still hundreds of them still flying today, as you've heard in the presentation. So let's go start it up now. As we go to start up, you can see I've got the checklist ready up there for starting. Let me just pull the main one over. I'll pull it over in big first so you can read it, and then I'll keep it up there in the corner so that it's easy to see as you go along. All right, so um, the first thing we have to do is just, you know, the battery switch, make sure it's off, the battery that's built into the plane, but make sure that the battery cart is on and attached, and that's what we've just done. So you can see here, you can just go through the checklist to see what's going to happen. We're going to put the fuel booster pumps on, the two of those. We're going to crack the throttle one inch, which is typical of a lot of startups. Propeller levers are going to be maximum RPM full forward toward the firewall. Master ignition switch on. And I'll show you how that works. It's tricky in the sim because it's a very small movement between on and off. Then the right, magne right ignition magneto. So what they call it right ignition magneto. So the magneto lever. And some of them called it a like chicken head switch or something like that. It has a tail on it. The tail is for leverage when you're turning it. 
but the actual pointer on it is what you really are interested in. Think of my whole arm as the trail, and I'm just going to point to where I want the magneto to be. Mixture control, auto rich, meaning full forward, as they show in the diagram. Now, this is right out of the manual that comes with this in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and it's just excellent. I based this whole presentation on checklists and manuals that I found online for the DC-3, and then I finally found this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the manual that comes with it was hidden in the official folder DC3, and so I finally found it. This is excellent, the way they've done this, and the, and the colors and the pictures and the, everything that they've done here. All right, so once we've got the levers set, as you heard, you need to have those levers so you can do that. You can see here, here's our magnetos with that lever at the back, but the pointer is what's important right here, where it says left is off, right is on both. And it's great that they give us visuals so that it's very easy to understand when you're going through the checklist the first time. Once you've done it a few times like I have, you can just go up and do these things. So right engine primer on for four seconds. So the right engine primer, these aren't the primers, these are the starters. I'll go show you the primer switches. And then right ignition magneto on both, like they see here. Wait four to five seconds. And that's because you, you're, you're putting on, uh, you're, you're doing the right engine starter or energize. So we're going to click this. You can count four seconds, but it'll actually reset itself. But after four seconds, then we're going to hit the mesh button. And the mesh button will also reset itself back to center. All right, now, uh, when we do the energize, you can see it's right, down is right, and up is left. The mesh is just on and off, okay? So down is right, uh, up is left, and the mesh button is similar. So what we want to do is we want to press the energize button and we're going to the right one first, so we're coming down, and then we're counting four uh, seconds, and then we're going to mesh. And then uh, after the mesh, we wait three seconds, and then right engine primer. Now, in fact, in here, it does say in our checklist that we're supposed to wait for 15 turns. And I'm not sure where exactly, right here, 15 blades. Well, 15 blades, I was looking for 15 revolutions, but it, uh, I never did get to count that high. But uh, 15 blades, so we'll do that. Once that first engine is running, we can turn off the ground power, not needed anymore because it, the, the single engine will be generating power, and the battery switch can go on. Now, and then the fuel booster pumps go off, right? So, so now, you know, from here on, we'll, we'll think about taxing, but we're going to let it warm up. And this is one of those kind of planes you got to let it warm up. So now that we know the procedure, let's just come back to here, and we will... Uh, just keep the checklist up there just for reference so that we know what's going on and right from the start It says battery cart as we said, so we now have the battery cart attached. Let's just have a quick look here at Control six will get us to the top most of the things we need are up here Let me point out a couple things like you saw in the presentation. There's your primer switches energizer mesh switches booster pump switches magneto and ignition on and off right there master ignition I've left the tags, the pop-up tags, so that it's easy to see. You might want to do the same until you get to know what all of the things are. All right, so now with this view, it's as simple as this. So you saw what it said at first is the engine primer. And then we're going to start. We're going to keep this these magnetos in the both position. They're actually there by default. I've just, I've just spawned in, and they're actually both in the default position. So let's get this left one back to off. Give you a quick view of what that looks like. I think this could still be a better view anyway because that's all the things that we need to do here. So this is in the off position. This one is in the uh, both position, which is exactly what we want. Now we're going to prime the right engine first. Prime. It'll shut itself off. So you, you could count the five seconds or so. Off it goes. Now we're going to energize and count to five. Thousand and one. Thousand and two. 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, mesh right engine. Have a look outside now. That's actually a real plane going over my head here. <laughs> and as soon as that starts up, you can count 15 blades, but as it gets to this speed, very hard to see blades. All right, so there it is starting up. Give it one more primer right here. And there we go. We should have ourselves an engine start. And we don't. So what could we have possibly done? One thing that's not in the checklist, which I should have mentioned before we started, we don't have fuel. 
it's actually good for you to see this in the presentation. I've done this a lot of times already. <laughs> and when I see that happening, it's fuel starved. We did the procedure properly. Magnetos are on both. You can double check the procedure. Where does it say to turn on the fuel? All right, there's our problem. Let's go to one of our views. This view maybe. Yeah, that'll work. You can see our fuel's in the off position for the right, right engine and fuel's off in the off position for the left engine. So let's just move over here. We want the right one to be on the right tank. Now you can put it on auxiliary if you want, but we'll put it on right. And this will be normal cruise setting too. And then the left engine will be on the left tank. And just make sure it actually gets there. There we go. And this is that similar thing too. It's got a thinner back piece where it's good for leverage for the back of your fingers, but the front part is actually the pointer. All right, so this front part here, the shorter part that actually points to the indents. There we go. And then we also, while we're here, we also want to look at these. All right, so remember it's propellers full forward, both of them in auto rich. You can see those indents work beautifully. I've got independent ones on my Bravo and we'll put them to, to auto rich or full forward. And this is cracked one inch about there. And we'll take a look at that once we get it rolling. So now things are set, fuel is on, and away we go. Let's do that again. Come back inside, control six gets us to the top. Zoom in a little just so for ease of seeing what's going on here. All right, so engine primer. Now I've already primed the engine once. I'm gonna leave the primer this time for my second start. I'm going straight over here. My magneto for the right is on both. I'm going straight over here, follow the checklist, turn the right starter on. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000. There we go. It's going to start this time, and this time it's going to stay running. Once it does start up, after 15 blades, you can hear it starting up. We're going to give it primer one more time, as it says in the checklist, for whatever reason. <laughs> now we just follow the checklist. So now, while we're here, we're going to go back to a normal view and take a look at our instruments. What I want to do here on this view is just take a look at our RPMs. We want to be above a thousand for RPM. So I pretty much got the throttles in the right spot. Um, 30 and just above a thousand works great for me. Uh, when we do run up, we'll be up there uh, a lot higher. So that's good for one engine. The other engine, we got to go and start it up now. Rocking and rolling, looking good. You could even look across here. You, Typically, every time I start an engine in an airplane, I look at temperatures and pressures. Temperatures are rising on the right engine. They won't get up there yet. They just started, right? And uh, I can see that other pressures are good. That you, As you look across, fuel pressure is good, oil pressure is good. And that's what you're looking for. If oil pressure isn't there, then it's of, of concern. The temperature will eventually get there. All right, as you can see, temperatures are rising here. Carb air is rising. That's your carburetor heat controls, right? And if we look over here, there should be some hydraulic pressure now. None. No hydraulic pressure. Interesting. I thought we'd have some hydraulic pressure already. All right, so let's go have a look now at control six. We're going to start another engine. All right, so let's go over here to the left one. Zoom in again like that. Left one here. That's left, right, and both. We're going to do a run up so you know what that looks like, you guys. We're going to prime the left engine now. Prime, let that stop. Good, over here to the left starter, which is in the up position. You can see my little arrows pointing up. Just gotta bring your arrow around till you got it pointing in the right direction. There's pointing down, there's pointing up. And after a while, you can get rid of these pop-ups. All right, so pointing up, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. And then we go mesh left engine out we go count the blades four eight twelve and away we go and then we do one last primer over there and we just go make sure it's set now my throttles are set equal so it should be okay and i look down here and i see let's do one more like this We'll leave it like that. And I can see my RPMs are similar. And I can see that my manifold pressures are similar. And that's a good one. That'll keep the generator going. That'll keep the warmth going. I think they say minimum a thousand and let it warm up. All right. And as we look across, we'll see that the right engine should be warmer. Here we see the right engine, the oil temperature. 
in the green looking good this one's just started so it's starting to go up we're good all right I'm curious you know about the hydraulic pressure it's interesting that only the left engine drives the hydraulic pressure and that's something I just learned now while I was doing this presentation okay flaps are at zero we don't need them for takeoff unless we're doing a short field takeoff and you can do a quick check of the instruments while you're here now as you can see here some of these instruments are gyro driven gyro instruments I should say and they're vacuum driven in this plane we can see airspeed is in miles per hour that's good to note that's why I've quoted all of the speeds in miles per hour some of the navigation instruments we're not going to use at first I will do a demonstration using some of the nav instruments or even the retrofit using the 530-430 I will do a demonstration today of this navigation which is a beautiful thing called the gyro pilot it's really an altitude uh, sorry it's really just a a pitch hold and a direction hold a heading hold it's really what it is and it's beautiful and it works great now while we were continuing with our presentation and with our demonstrations we're going to be looking at these two dials the most obviously as you've been many of you have done GA planes it's always about RPMs and manifold pressure and then of course we check all the other things along the way downwind checks and cruise checks along the way now these are the carb heat levers let me give you a different view of that these blue levers are carb heat there's a, a locking mechanism there that locks it in place so vibration doesn't change it but you set them first and here we see the percentage of carburetor heat and you would look at the temperature of the engine typically in cruise after you're up there and then you could set these to warm up the carburetor or not if you expect carburetor ice if you don't expect ice it's still a normal cruise check to do carb heat hot if the engines run rough then there was carburetor heat and then and then you put them back to cold again if you want but you know nothing wrong with carburetor heat our our cars or our conventional older cars use uh, heat from the exhaust back up into you know the exhaust manifold back up into our carburetors to make it actually burn the fuel much better here's our trim tab here for the pitch trim and so you'd want to use a different view for that just to make sure that's set also this, this is checklist item stuff but uh, number seven four five there's the one I want <laughs> I want a number five so it's hard to see that trim let me just use, use my the cursor keys there it is wow it's hard to see that <clears throat> and there it says nose down nose up normal trim stuff I'm going to use the trim wheel on my Bravo as I spin it you can see there's a bit of a nose up and pulling back on the wheel and then there's a neutral and then checklist it just says neutral make sure that trims are all neutral that one's neutral if you look back down below you'll see both of those are neutral and here you see uh, rudder trim neutral and aileron trim neutral and typically I don't need these until I better look outside see if I'm moving no nope, good uh, yeah the, the parking brakes on uh, I don't need those until um, until I have an engine out or something like that or, or certainly an unbalanced load this one right here is your is your uh, tailwheel lock I think you saw a picture of that we don't need it locked until we are straight on the runway ready for takeoff and I've got it mapped to my go around button on my throttle so that's you're going to need that without jumping down here with your head inside the cockpit on the floor uh, as you're coming in as a landing all right engines are running things have warmed up we're good to go after the first engine the checklist does say that you can remove the power you can remove it after the second one so I'm just going to turn on the battery over here in the upper left turn off the ground power which will actually in the in the simulator actually removes it completely from the plane it's better to do this in real life with only one engine running because you can come in from the inoperative engine side to undo it and take it away with both of these running I'd be a little nervous going in there and undoing it <laughs> So I should have done that after the first engine. All right, we got the idea. Let's stay in here where it's a little bit quieter. All right, and that's our startup demonstration, you guys. Next, we're going to do our run-up. We're just going to turn into wind and do our run-up. So what we want to do is move over to that part in engine run-up. They've got taxi, then run-up, but we're going to do this right now. Now, what I'll mention is you saw a better picture of this. I'm just going to find it on here, but you saw a better picture of this um, in the presentation where I found some notes about run-up further back. 
where we actually take the uh, take it up to 30 on the MP. So what I'm going to do right now is face it into wind. Let me just remove the checklist for the moment so it's not in the way. Here I am at Oshawa Airport on the grass, which is comfortable for this plane. And I'm just going to taxi, I'm just going to turn and face into wind. We're going to be using runway 30, so basically it's out there on my left side. And so all we're going to do now is first thing first before we, the very first taxi is get your feet on those um, rudder pedals. You're going to release the parking brake, which is underneath. Right there, 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 there we go. Parking brake is here. Now you cer certainly a lot of us will map that or you can use control period. When we release it, it's gonna start moving. There's release, okay? So it's just a push in to release, pull it out to set the parking brake. All right, let's just look outside while we do that because it's gonna start moving. I'm gonna press control period and then you can see I'm starting to move already. All right, so let's get back to a normal view look out the window and see where we're going. Now I just really just want to get out here onto the tarmac, do the run up. I'm going to turn into wind which will basically be over to my left. The winds are actually calm and variable but we're going to use runway 30 so you typically want to be faced the same direction which is pretty much like that. Let me just come back over here so I'm not in front of a plane. Pretty much like that we'll say for today. All right and I put on the brakes. So taxiing and touching the brakes one of the first things you do to make sure your toe brakes work. You're going to need those when you do a landing anyway. And now from here to do the run up, set the parking brake. I just did it with my keystroke on my on my uh, on my keyboards. But you know, like when you look at this right now, I'm not creeping forward. The brakes are on. I'm going to be putting this up to a higher RPM now. Let's go straight into it now. I'm going to go back to this view, back into here, because we're going to be looking at RPMs. We're looking for an RPM drop. So I'm going to set this according to the manual uh, and it's going to have somewhere around 22 on the RPM gauge, 2200. When I do this check of the magnetos, it'll probably drop to 2100. But we don't want it to be much of a difference between the two engines or between the two magnetos. And we don't want it to be a big drop between the two. So let's just take a look at this now. We're going to take one of the engines now. We'll leave the other one where it is. We're going to take the right engine all the way up to 2200 RPM or so. It's really actually going to be 30 on the MP dial. I think that's what it says in the checklist, 30. You can check that. And it'll be somewhere around, as you can see, 2200. Perfect. That's on the right engine, you guys. And if you're ever curious about that, you can just, in case your controls are crossed, you can see on here, it'll say right or left. All right, now that we've got it up to the speed we want, we're going to go up to the magnetos again, control six, zoom in a little. And you know, what we're seeing here is, is now we're going to check the magnetos. And so I, um, the magnetos are actually two separate circuits that will power the spark plugs, for those who don't know what that is. And, and the magnetos are separate circuits by design. Each cylinder, all 28 cylinders in each engine, each cylinder that has a piston in it has two spark plugs, like many or maybe all engines in aviation. So there's two spark plugs in that same cylinder in case one spark plug fouls, in case one spark plug doesn't have a spark, it gives you that safety net, all right? And that's by design. So they're called left magneto, right magneto because they're on the left and right side of one cylinder. Now think about this, there's two spark plugs per cylinder. As we say earlier, there's a, uh, um, 14 cylinders altogether, two rows of seven. So we've got 28 spark plugs in this thing. So what we're doing right here now, we're checking half the spark plugs by just simply doing this. All right, so I'm gonna go here. It says set magneto to right. So I'm gonna go right. Hear the drop. I'll, we'll go look at the drop in a second. Back to both. So you hear the drop, you look at the gauge. Right now I can't even show you both gauges unless I do some kind of split screen. But I'll just jump down and take a look at that in a minute. So then now we also go to the left magneto. So one, two. Now we're on the left magneto only. The right magneto, right spark plug of every cylinder of this one engine is not sparking right now. You don't leave it there forever. But what I want to do here in the sim, of course, we're learning. What I want to do is take a look here and I see it's at 2100, not 22. So it did do a bit of a drop. We expect that. And now we've got a plug that's fouling. So we've got to be able to 
jump back in there real quick and put it back to both. You shouldn't leave it on one forever. It's just a test to make sure it is going to work. There, it's back on both. It'll, it'll clear up the fouled plug. Remember, the plug that's not energized, the plug that doesn't have a spark, can foul. It can have oil buildup. It can have, well, there's still explosions happening in that cylinder. So uh, it can end up being what they call fouled, which would then not spark anymore. So you put it back on both as soon as you've got an indication of what you're looking for and keep, keep those engines running smoothly and keep those spark plugs clean. So that's the right engine, and now it should be back up. Oops, I'll leave it like that. It should be back up to uh, 2200, and there we go. And that's good. Now, I want to bring that one back at the same time. Nice and gentle. At the same time, bring this one up nice and gentle. Bring it up the left engine to 30 on the MP. And that should result in about 2200 also. Similarly. Right about there. And it's settling in at... 2250. I want it to be accurate so we can tell how much it actually drops. And now we're doing this engine. You can see this one over here is running a bit, one's running a bit smoother than the other. All right, so now we are on the left engine. And so now we want to, and, and to have a quick look at that, you can just tell by looking at the levers here. We have the left engine lever here, the one before this one, the left engine lever is up further. All right, and that's what we're doing. Control six. Look at that. Here we go with left. We're going to left. Sorry, that's right <laughs> on this one. That's right. I heard it drop. Back to both. Left. Got it. Heard it drop. Back to both. And the drop again. You would be you would always be glancing down at that RPMs to make sure. So there we go. We've done our check. Now the last check would be the hydraulic check. Go back to the screen. Come back to here and we'll just move over. This is the fast way. There is a view for this, but I can just look at it this way. This view for me gives me a glance at hydraulics and a glance at everything else. Um, so there's my hydraulics. One main thing that's used for hydraulics is your gear, but you can't test that while you're on the ground um, unless you put jacks under the plane. But uh, what we can test is the flaps because they, you know, they're heavy duty hydraulic users. So let's drop our flaps. We'll undo the flap handle. Let's go back down to the floor, you guys. Remember the floor position here? Down on the floor, there is a flap handle. Well, that's, that's not the best view. It's actually over here. Um, you've seen it, the picture of it in the presentation. I think it's over here. Here. And i got to guess at all my views. You can see all the different things that we have here. If you want to, you just leave your pop-ups up there. There's your flap handle. I'm going to put it down. Oh, it didn't actually move the handle, but you can move the handle. You can pull it out and move it. But it, it did actually move the flaps. You can see the flaps are down. You can see them starting to come down here. So let's just have a quick look at what happened to that hydraulic gauge like that. And we'll do another flap. We're looking at this gauge right here. Wow, ever so slightly. It really, we got such great, and it's probably because we still got one way up there, right? Let's bring it back down. Yeah, so you can see the gauge start to fall a little. I brought the left engine back down again. And then from here, I'm going to put the flaps up, which also uses hydraulic pressure. Let's try that. And we should actually see, we should actually see the gauge move a little. I'm not seeing that here, but it's rock steady at 150. That's great. Or 750, I should say, yeah. Yeah, so that noise you're hearing, that's the flaps going up and down. It should be all the way up now. Yeah, we're clean. And the indicator right here says we're good, right over my shoulder here. We're good. So there's the run-up, you guys. Now we can taxi, and that'll be... I'll just do that right now. Let's say that we do have taxi clearance from the tower, from ground, and we're going to taxi over to 304, a north, uh, sorry, an east departure, west departure, whatever it is that we want to do. I'm bringing up the power. I'm releasing the parking brake. I'm going to do a quick brake check again. It's working. Good. And now we'll move. I see I got some kind of cart there on the field. Yo, we got taxi clearance. Look out. And so I'm going to just, I'm not sure if it's going to move at all. I want to turn left up ahead here. So I'm just going to do this. This is the taxiway that I want, as you can see here. Always nice to see a plane taken off in front of us.
I'm going to get over here and, and, and get ready for... Um, now it's easy enough to, to to do this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go the hold short and we'll get ready for taxi or sorry takeoff clearance. Let me, let me just say that get used to what this looks like. How does that look in that kind of view? How does it also look in this view? In this view, you know, I want to be probably like this. I've already got clearance to cross this runway, so we're going down the, to the end. Right about there, I think is right. Let me just see from the outside. Yeah, just about maybe over a little to the left. And then go back and look again and see what that looks like. Actually, once once I align myself, it's pretty much down by the lower part of the blade. Now, this view you see out the window, everybody, is while well, you're taxiing, look at your instruments along the way. But I also want to point to the out the window. This view is your takeoff view. This is your your plane already in a takeoff kind of position. You can see there that I've got really no wind at all on my indicators, but it's variable. It's all over the place. All right. Remember to keep your throttles up to a thousand or so while you're warming up and while you're doing this, and then just brake as you need. Let's just come out here. Here's my hold short line. I'm going to stay like this so I can see a visual of what's coming. And from here we would get our clearance. And it brings speed up a bit. Now we've got our clearance. And for this demonstration, you guys, I'm not going through all the uh, radio procedures. That'll be another lesson course and I just want to make sure that there we go and there's a plane nearby that sort of just uh, did a go around I just saw that in the sky good for him here in this simulator a lot of people don't know the rules and uh, they'll run right into you on the runway <laughs> they'll run right into you on the on the uh, on the taxiway even all right so my view was sort of like let's see if I can pull this off again now you want to get accurate on this, so down the runway, pretty much down the middle of my body, pretty much where that blade is right there. Almost looks like someone took off from the other direction, which is quite possible in the sim, you guys, not like a controlled airport where there's somebody's controlling all this. Looks like a beaver, he's got his landing light on, and away he goes. Sounds good. All right, so ready to take off. So one of the things that they've mentioned as we go in, let's go into our checklist before we get started. I'm going to put my parking brake on. Make sure my RPMs are up enough to keep things warm. Let's bring those RPMs up. Right about there, maybe around 1,000 to 1,300, you guys. Somewhere around there. All right, things are getting warm. I'm almost aligned. I say almost because now we're gonna have to put on our, we're gonna lock our tail wheel. So I'm gonna make sure I am heading down the runway, something like that. Gotta be accurate. You, you do have some control. Yeah, you know, put the parking brake on and it just like puts me sideways. But you know, the point is that even when you lock the tail wheel, you'll still be able to, once you get enough speed, you'll still be, and the tail lifts, you'll be able to use the, the, the air rudder, I'll call it that, the normal conventional rudder to steer because your tail wheel will be off the ground. But while you leave this thing at high speed, it's hard on the tail wheel. It's also going to make the tail wheel kind of wobble. So this is why we lock it before we take off. And I'll do that in a second. What I want to do was also show you, again, looking out the screen, this is what you learn in basic flight. And I don't need to talk about that today. But in basic flight, you learn what does it look like when you're climbing? What does it look like out the window when you're straight and level? And some of you will be going straight into IFR flight with this thing, which you can do. But the point is, what's that view look like and right now we're climbing my horizon is below the latch it's just above this part right here where the windshield wiper is and that's the windshield wiper right there and so um, you want to see that view that's sort of our climb view but we're going to set speed when we climb uh, when we're straight and level once we are actual flying i'm going to show you what that view looks like and i'm using this latch on the window as my pretty much my straight across horizon view and these are the sort of things you want just as your visual cues as you're flying. You can certainly look at your instruments, your artificial horizon. We can lock in our pitch here. All these things can happen. But what does it look like out the window? And this is what you learn in basic flying, of course, right? So we're ready to roll. Let's go to the checklist and say, what do we need to do when we want to go fly? And it mentions in here, before takeoff, let's come out to here. And before takeoff, it says propellers full forward for maximum RPM. They are. Mixtures full forward to auto rich, they are. Gyros 
set and uncaged. All right, and you check those. You just do the dial to make sure it's level the way it's supposed to be. And you notice that it says cow flaps trail. Now they were open the whole time in the checklist. They're open all the time when you're on the ground. Over here where you see the hydraulic pressure. So here it's open on the ground, but we're about to take off. So we're gonna put this to trail. All right, and there it says trail. Trail, it should say auto, because what it's going to do is close as it needs or open as it needs, depending on the speed of the plane. I think it's based on speed, not temperature, but you're still gonna monitor and either close them or open them according to the temperatures of your plane. All right, so that's part of the checklist, set that. We'll come back over and look at this checklist, bring it back on in the upper corner so we can keep reference to that. And it says booster pumps on. Well, the booster pumps are still on. We will turn them off after we are airborne. So here we are, engine run up, we did that. Before takeoff, mixture out a rich, cow flaps trail, I just did that. Propellers increase RPM, set and uncage the gyros as we said. Fuel booster pumps are on, they're still on. Tailwheel locked, right? That's the last thing I gotta do is tailwheel lock, and then away we go. If you look down here again to there, there's the tail wheel. I have it on my throttle so I can just go, we're locked, all right, for takeoff. Once the tail is off, we're gonna do level first and then we're going to do, we can adjust rudder because tail's off the ground and also the locking wheel is off the ground. So we can adjust with, simply with rudder or even if we needed to with differential braking if we're gonna go off the runway. So that's the idea, everybody. Let's do it. All right, I'm gonna use this position right here. This is my normal flying position right here. Some instruments and some out the window. We've got a nice, beautiful left view, nice, beautiful right view if we need it. And this is the way I'll use it for flying. All right, full forward on everything. Let go of the parking brake. The airspeed's already indicating it's alive. We're already at 40 knots. We're gonna lift off around the 85 to 90. I'm gonna give it a bit of right rudder as we, there we go, as we start to level off, now we're starting to head to the left of the field, we start to level off a little bit more right rudder, stay on this side of the runway. Wow, kind of sloppy. I'm overcorrecting. And someone's at the other end ready to take off. Let's see if we can lift off ahead of them. There we go. And you can see now we've lift off. You could touch the brakes to stop the wheels rotating, and we're going to pull them back into the, the cells now. There we go. Up they go. Oh, sorry, they're just into the landing gear compartment. All right, now what are we going to set here? I think it said 92 for our speed for takeoff. We are at 92 right there. I'm going to trim that right there. And it's slow, you guys. You got to do set your attitude, set your trim, see how it settles. It'll settle in. 95, 96 knots. Let's just keep it going. And we're rolling. Now that we're rolling, I'm gonna set some power here. Remember, if, uh, booster pumps are off. Oh, let's go to that checklist. I'll stay there like this for the moment. All right, let's just go to the checklist to show you this. After takeoff, landing gears up. Yep, wheels stop rotating with brakes. Power reductions, fuel po booster pumps are off. All right, there's where we're at right now. So, wheels are up, brakes were on to make them stop turning. Now I'm gonna go up to the booster pumps up here. I'm on the wrong screen, there we go and I'm gonna turn off the booster pumps here and here. They look to be in the off position already. Oops, don't get too high. Um, see what happens when you get your head out of the cockpit? There we go. Yowzer. Okay, and now we'll do some reduction in power here. I'm gonna bring it back to 30 or so on the MP, maybe 35 for now. And I'm gonna bring my RPM back to 26 or so. It's in the red line area. Let me, sorry, I should have been on this screen. So it was in the red line area. This was up there at 45 or so. I brought it back to something more comfortable here. Here I'm at 25, maybe 26 on the RPM. Because we're still climbing, there we go. 26 or so, staying in the green. General rule is just stay in the green, you guys. I could even take this up to 35, we're still climbing. Now, don't keep your head in the cockpit like I'm doing. Try to make sure that you uh, can still keep a normal flight here. Look at that beauty. All right, we've done uh, run up, we've done taxi, we've done takeoff, and now we're going to be setting for cruise, probably somewhere around 3,000. That's Lake Ontario on our left. I just flew out of Oshawa Airport. And if you want some fresh air, oh, there's some fresh air. I think that'd be loud and I think it'd be very fast. 
All right, I'm going to turn to the north. Well, that way's Toronto. We could head to Toronto and have some beautiful sightseeing, but that's not the point today. So I'm going to still climb. As I'm turning, I'm losing a bit of uh, my uh, pitch attitude here. And I'm still I'm going faster than I should on a climb. I want to climb to 3,000, so I'm just going to pitch up a little while I'm turning toward the north. That's due west out there to the left. I'm heading toward the north, as you can see here. And I'll set cruise and then that'll be it for this demonstration. I'll come back around on a big, huge, wide, big, wide uh, circuit is what we'll do, right-hand circuit towards 3-0. As we're nearing 3,000, I'm going to obviously bring the horizon up. And as I near toward the north, there we go, there's the horizon. Remember, that's a slow beast. Try to anticipate it ahead of time. And as I level off, I'm going to pick up speed. And I want to stay at 3,000. I went down a little too far. And I'm going north and I'm going 3,000 or so. The next demonstration will be the navigation equipment while we're doing this. It won't be on for very long. I'm just going to show you how to set it. And right about there. Still wants to climb on me, so I'm going to set there. You notice the horizon now? Looks like that. Right across my latch. That's what I'm using as my indicator. Maybe just above the wire and down the latch. And I can see down here, I've got pretty much level on my FPMs and I'm staying at 3000 or so. As I'm picking up speed, there's more lift, of course. So I'm trimming down again, trimming down a little more. All right, and that way I can stay level. Look at that beautiful sight. All right, level flight, 150, 160 knots and gaining. And as I gain, I can start to pull back a bit more of that MP and come back to a more of a cruise setting. But uh, let's have some fun with that. So as you can see, we can change this setting here. Let's just change it more to the south. There, we're going to change it to 180. You can see here on the artificial horizon, it's actually turning. It's going to turn more towards 180, heading toward the lake, and then level off of that. So you can actually just do this the same as you would with any autopilot set the heading, leave it on, set the heading. As you change the heading, you'll see it go back. I just want to make it that way now. Now we're turning to the left, as you can see from here. Oh, wow, I've lost a lot of altitude here. I better trim that. All my turns, I'm actually losing altitude left and right. And there's my turn to the left. <clears throat> I'll take it back to the right. Anyway, we'll get it back to 180 because we want to go south from here. So there's our south heading. We'll leave that, and we're just going to give it a bit more power because uh, we're, we're losing some altitude real faster. 2,000 feet here, the elevation of, uh, at this area it gets higher as you go further north, so it could even be 1,000 feet right here. We might only be 1,000 feet above the ground, so you gotta be careful when you get this far north. There's Lake Scugog off my right wing. I'm heading south towards Lake Ontario, and I'm just following this road, pretty much following this road down to a town called Curtis. And Curtis is my checkpoint. I'll turn there, which is pretty much on a final for 3-0 uh, from about five miles out or six miles out. And that'll be a good place to set up for our landing. So we'll come back here when we get to Curtis. Coming up on Highway 407 Toll Highway right here. And uh, the other toll highways along the way. This is a newer one over here to my left. Uh, just trying to keep my altitude here manually as I make adjustments. Further down there, probably that intersection right there on hard to see right now. That's our Curtis, the town of Curtis, and a big intersection there, 401 intersection. I think it's a 135 coming north. And that's where we want to make our turn to go to final and set up for final. So let's get that ready to go before we get there. And the whole idea behind it is get ready for landing. And in our landing cruise checklist, Let's turn the checklist on. All right, so before landing, let's bring this over so you can see it bigger. Before landing, automatic pilot off. Altimeters are set. We get the barometric pressure setting from an ATIS. Fuel selectors valves to the main left and right. Mixture auto rich. So let's change mixture to auto rich. We've been on carburetor cold. We haven't been on long enough. Bump, uh, fuel booster pumps on. All right, so auto rich and on are the two main things we got to do here before we turn for a final approach. So we come down to our control, go back here with my cursor, 
control three, uh, sorry, four, gets back to here, back up to rich, we're good. And uh, tanks are already set, left and right full. Let's get back to a normal view here so we can make sure we're still level. Yeah, we're above 3,000 now. But this is the town of Cordis right here. And this is where we want to turn because here it's actually a great turn toward final. So I'm going to start bringing back some power. I want to get down to flap range. You can see right here it says, uh, in this plane it says, uh, uh, airspeed is uh, no flaps, don't lower flaps. When airspeed exceeds 112, we're at 140. So I'm going to pull back some power. Pull back some power. Hold the altitude. I'm going to turn to final. Uh, hold the altitude. Don't know why the, that bar is still up there. There we go. And take a look at what we're doing here. Speed is still way up there, so I'm going to pull up, lead off some of that speed, like that, and then turn to final like that. And I'm going to turn to a 3-0 setting, as you can probably guess. You know, 3-0 is going to be the runway we're going to come in on. Way up there, six miles away, we can't even see it yet. There's our speed dropping. As soon as I get a little lower, or sorry, the speed a little lower, right around there, we're going to be heading in for a landing. And we'll line that up as we get a little closer. All right, speed's down to 100 and, and uh, 30, 125, 120. I'm going to just pull up a little like this and get that speed down. We're good. All right, gear's coming down. Gear could have been down before now, but we're doing it now. There comes the gear down and locked. As the gear comes down, you see we're losing some more speed. I can do my first flap. There's the flap indicator right there. As you do flaps, you notice the speed's down right around landing speed right now. But we want to go further flaps. I'm going to do half flaps till I get closer, and then I'll do the rest of the flaps as I get there. And the speed's getting dangerously low to stall, so I'm going to lower the nose and increase some power. Full forward on the propeller levers and I'm just adjusting with throttle now as we head in toward the runway. Now, we could use ILS or something like that, but for now we just want to line up until we see a visual. And you could even do that as you scan the horizon. I see a runway right there. All right, so now I'm going to drop more flaps. If you see right there off my nose, I just had to look forward there. There's the runway. And I'm going to come over here to this building here and then line up for my straight in. Come back a bit like that. What's my speed? 85. It should be a bit more, so I'm going to just lower the nose a little more. A little bit more uh, power. We got full flaps now, and we're going to be turning to final in one second. Right about here. Let's go back out and see where we are. Lower the nose. Looking good. Now, the um, wheel is locked when you look at the checklist. The wheel, the tail wheel is locked for landing but you want to have a switch nearby to change it to unlock so you can taxi when you're going slow. All right, when you're going slow, you have no air over the rudders, so there's no way that you can. Let's have a look at that landing from the inside view here. And we'll do a combination of outside and inside views. I'll just do two landings and uh, record both so you can see what it looks like from the outside of the plane as we're landing and from the inside of the plane. I'm trying to stay here, as I mentioned before, I'm at three quarter flaps. I'm trying to stay here at around 92. Here I am, because I got the nose down some more, I got to lose some altitude. I actually picked up some speed, reduced some power. I'm at over 100. I'll slow that down to 92, 95, maybe even 90 as I get closer. There's my last flap. Let's see if we can do a different view this time. We'll do this view. And of course, the gear didn't come down again, so I'm going to put that down manually on the keyboard. I gotta go check that binding. That was my gear switch. All right, now settle it down to the 92 knots as we go in. I wanna keep this view so that, you know, you're gonna see the outside view in a minute, or I'll switch back and forth and post when I pull this video together. There's what it looks like, line it up properly. I'm gonna pull up a bit more um, as I get closer, but you know, I'm not judging by the Vazzy, but I can pretty much, you know, the trees are in the way, but I can pretty much set that up as I'm getting closer here. There's my speed more in line with what it should be right there. 95 knots, a little bit decaying, so I might pick up some more throttle on that right about now. Vazzy actually looks good, even though I'm not trying to do the Vazzy, so that means I'm on three degree approach right now. The trees are pretty low there. 
We'll do some outside views and inside views, but here we're seeing what's happening from the inside. All right, as I cover, as I go over the threshold, I cut power. Got to remember how high we are. The main wheels are touching first, right about now. As I line up, because once the tail wheel comes down, it locks. There's the, the main wheels. Making sure I stay in the center line before that tail wheel drops. I'm not forcing the tail wheel down. I'm not pulling back. I'm letting it go down on its own, which will take the whole runway, but it still gives a good demonstration. All right, you could force the tail wheel down if you want. Um, that'll give more resistance, of course. You can also be differentially touching the brakes. I'm gonna do the full length of the runway. And there, the tail wheel's down. It is a locked wheel, but now I'm going to unlock it um, because I'm slow enough to manage this tail wheel to do steering. And that's it. That's what it looks like from the inside, you guys. And now we'll just taxi off. I'm going to taxi off onto the grass and pull into the parking lot. And we're going to see that from the outside too. We'll do two or three landings just so you can see the different views as we go along. But I want you to see what it looked like from in here. Now some of you will want to do this view, but it doesn't really give you the proper perspective of the pitch of the plane. So it's not the best view for landing. You don't know if you're going to nose into the runway or what. It's hard to do this view. And there's the bus waiting for us to take us away back to Toronto. <laughs> or we could just fly there. <laughs> but this is the normal view, you guys, and uh, great to be back on the ground. But uh, let's go for another flight and we'll do some outside views. Take a look from the outside view. You can see that we're heading over, not quite to the right, but we're heading over a bit to the right. We'll do a turn here over the... This is actually the main part of Oshawa, the main town of Oshawa. They don't like us flying lower than 2,000 over top of the city. But that's fine. We're just lining up here. And then I'll turn to final. You see right there. Uh, probably right about there. Just gonna let me have a look here. Yeah, right about there. We should see it coming into view. And there's some more flaps. And we'll put the last flap down as we as we line up on final. And here's our turn to final. So you can see I've got my my power is still relatively up there because I have flaps. And all I'm after right now is airspeed. This is the important part. And I'm still lower than I should be. I should be at 92, so I'm just lowering the nose a little. You can see there's our runway in sight. Time for full flaps. As we get positioned here, let me have a better look here. There's our runway right there. And we're heading in on, on a long final toward the runway. Now we can take our time and get set up properly. You heard the reduction in power, and you'll see the last flap coming in soon as we round out somewhere around the 1500 mark. There we go. And you can see there's where we're headed. Let's see how this looks from the outside. Oh, we gotta put our gear down too. That hasn't happened yet. Oops, like that, like that. And get some drag going with the gear also. You can see the flaps now are good. Speed has come down. The gear can actually go down long before the flaps, really. You should have them down in lock so you don't have any surprises as you go along. So, Somehow they didn't activate with my switch, so we just did the shortcut. I just heard them lock into place. Look over here. I've got green, we're good. There we are. Bazzy's actually looking good, even though I'm not using it. I gotta clear the tree, so I gotta be careful with that. 90 knots, 89 knots, 87 knots, too slow. I wanna be 92 on touchdown. So you can see that I'm a bit slow, I'm gonna pull up some power here. A bit low in the Vazzy if you want to use that too. And now uh, let's see what this looks like from the outside. Here, we'll try that. Okay, let's try that. Main wheels first. Beautiful. Stay level. Let it bleed off on its own. Don't force that tail wheel down. Don't pull back and flare. Touch the brakes. Do some touching. You're doing fine adjustments while you still have a rudder. You can see the rudder moving over here. And as you, as you lose speed, the tail's gonna drop and it's a locked wheel. So you wanna be lined up at this point. I'm doing it a longer version here. You could actually be harder on the brakes. Longer version, let that wheel, there it is, touch down, it's locked. And it locked in whatever position I was in. And now I'm trying to steer with it, but all I've got at this point is differential braking. At this slowest speed and at this far down the runway, I've now unlocked the tail wheel and I can steer with it and that's what I'm doing right now, is steering with that tail wheel. 
it can land and go anywhere. But that's the landing, everybody, and that's how that works. We're going to do a shutdown next. Right about there. Make sure the tailwheel closes there. And normally that concrete block isn't in my way. That's a good place to sit right there, maybe a little further forward. All right, we'll do the shutdown next. Shutdown is, uh, shutting down the airplane is pretty straightforward, everybody. We're sitting here where we belong, in front of the hangar. When you look at the checklist, it's parking brake set. So we just come under here, set the parking brake first. That's on, where you pulled it out. And that's it. In, on, parking brake on. All right, and uh, the tail wheel is now free, but you don't have to lock that. But pretty much, you know, the engines are running, but pretty much the whole idea behind it is simply to pull your mixture. The engines will stop, get back up to here, and we turn off our main switches, our landing light, and whatever else we had running. And, uh, and just to set your magnetos back to zero, or sorry, back to off. Simple as that. And uh, all other switches are off. This thing should be cold and dark. And as you look at it, no hydraulic pressures, no lights are on, and we will secure the aircraft. And what secure does, it puts the chocks on. Let's have a quick look here. Puts the chocks on like that. And uh, puts a couple of fire extinguishers out there on the ground, all around the plane. And uh, we're ready to go. I mean, it wasn't that hard to actually turn it off and um, and set everything easily. A very easy plane to fly, that's for sure. Uh, the landing's the trickiest part, but uh, you get the hang of that after some practice. I'm still, that's the weakest part for me, is aligning it once it's on the runway. And, um, you know, staying, staying wheels up first, as you saw, tail wheel up first and let it settle on its own. Once it's down there, it's locked in place, and you've got... Uh, very little room for air, so get that thing aligned when you touch down, but looking good. Oh, I said I would look at others that are taking off, and then I saw DJing just took off. All right. Srap is there on the ground. Andrew's there. Thanks for flying yeah, with us, you guys. Srap's the one in the um, in the hangar. Uh, okay, I got DC3 out here on the grass with Srap on it. So maybe that's not Srap. Who's over in the hangar? Oh, that's Krabby one. Oh, sorry, Krabby. Krabby's yeah. in the hangar. Krabby's in the hangar, part way. Yeah, strap, straps <laughs> next to me, over, over yeah. next to me. And there's you guys right um, there. I I just put a link in uh, chat for the livery that I'm in right now. Oh, good, Andrew, because I want to get it. I like that livery. And there's my silver bird right there, you guys. Thanks for flying with us. And let's just have and, a quick and, look. And and if you want to flip back to my screen just for a sec, you, you sure. can have it, see what it see what that livery looks like. And then I'll line up. To do that and while you're doing that I'm gonna line up um, I'm gonna line up DJ and follow him in it's beautiful I like it Andrew are there others like it? Oh, Kiwi Craig's uh, taking off with the DC-3. No, he's coming in for a landing. All right, Andrew, I'm just going to come back here for a second. We've got action. There's DJ turning already. He's turning. He's very brave. That close to the airport. He's turning on the base now. And I see I missed Kiwi Craig coming in for a landing. Looks like he was successful on 3-0, you guys. We're just going to follow DJ in. Durham College is big out here, you guys. They're huge here in Oshawa. The main, uh, probably the main thing that happens here in Oshawa, their main export, their main industry, is GM, General Motors Canada. Their headquarters is here, their main factory is here, right down by the water there. So this is a, we call it the GM town. And uh, back when I was a consultant servicing computers in, in schools and school boards, I was... Uh, in this area a lot. My very first flight came out of this airport, just out of curiosity.
Uh, you know, following up, I'm not 100% sure. Let me see. What a nice landing that was. You guys, that was better than my landing. He didn't bounce. I'm trying to keep up with him here. He didn't bounce. See the tailwheel still off the ground? Let it fall on its own. Don't push it down. I mean, don't pull back on the yoke yet. You can be doing differential braking right now just to try and slow down a bit, but as you lose the airspeed, oops, can't do it. I'm going too fast here. As you lose the airspeed, the tailwheel drops. Sorry, it's all jittery. I got the wrong speed set. Nice landing. That was sweet. All right. Now, how'd you do? Comments, suggestions for beginners? I mean, each of you tried it also. We had quite in the Twitch channel, we had uh, maybe six of you were in the air with me, taking off landing, practicing. And this is why I typically call them workshops, everybody. Uh, but as you can see, um, you know, here's the passenger version, which uh, you can see that they lived in luxury back then. I don't have a sleeper version here in the sim, but this is the uh, passenger version. The cargo version can also have some cargo in the cargo bay. Uh, doors, stairs, um, all kinds of stuff that work on it properly, so it's pretty cool. So make sure you give me suggestions here on YouTube, constructive criticism about something I've missed, or certainly suggestions for others who are watching this video and there's something I'm missing, something you want to refine on, because a lot of you have flown this plane and uh, you can help others with it. This has been the Tuesday lesson, the legendary DC-3. And I do want to thank everybody for your participation. I appreciate you jumping in and flying with me here at Oshawa Airport. And uh, talk about so much fun flying this classic, this legendary airplane. Any questions at all, put them in chat. Of course, uh, put them in comments here on YouTube. Put them in chat. My chat is still open. I mean, it still works 24 by 7 in the Twitch stream, even if I'm not streaming. Uh, but you can also come to our Discord channel. From chat in Twitch, type in exclamation point Discord and it will give you the Discord invite link. And come to Discord, you'll see lots of questions, lots of answers, CFIs are there, beginners are there, everybody's there, and we carry on the discussion on Discord. It's been a pleasure, everybody. Let's go fly the legend.